Alright, Baltimore and Ohio. Uh, my wife and I have been playing a lot of train games recently. I got another thread that I handled those on, or another list that I handled those on. And, uh, well, this is one of the ones we played recently, and I thought I'd put it out because I, I, I really enjoyed uh, our two player play, and I wanted to give it a little bit of a playthrough uh, solo to see how it works out. I was tempted and having enough fun, and I, oh, this is always the case with XX games, and this is close enough, I'm going to count it as one, um, even though it has some significant differences. I always have this uh, feeling of, oh, jeez, I want to play it again right away, up until the last part of the game, and then it drags, and this has that same feature. Anyway. Let's talk a little bit first about the components, just to get them out of the way. Uh, get some wooden cubes. This is, uh, you know, sort of a hybrid between the winsome little wooden cube type games, and it uses them for the rails, and the XX style stock market manipulation, although only the branch that I tend not to like as much with a flat stock market, uh, not the big two-dimensional stock market, simply a linear one. The money is a pain in the ass. Yeah, I know. Most of you probably who like these rail games hate paper money anyway, and you say, hey, it's fine. I'm glad they didn't spend too much on making the money. But this money is so thin that I wish they hadn't. Uh, you know, I'm perfectly fine playing with uh, dredging money out of something else, even though I don't terribly like doing that, and it means that I have an incomplete game you know, in my possession. I can't just grab the box and go someplace to play it. But uh, this money is so much of a pain because of its thinness, both, and the gauge of the paper is very thin as well. But it's the fact that the actual money is thin that makes it even harder to handle. Card certificates are fine, serviceable, kind of pretty, but, uh, eh, I don't know. <laughs> These little company charters are nicely done, nice thick little things. They hold everything you need uh, for the company in a lot less space than most XX games provide. And they really hold everything that an XX game would, including a uh, certificate. Well, they don't hold little tokens on them, but you don't need as large a certificate holding uh, placemat as most XX games tend to provide. Um, the board has its annoyances. I had, first of all, it's kind of tough to read the numbers on the board. Um, I also had trouble distinguishing this is a block tech side. I missed that during part of my playthrough and ended up having to rectify the situation. It, it's not terrible, it's just somewhat less obvious than I'm used to in a game. And it looks reasonably attractive. It's, I don't know. And the cubes, well, cubes just don't work as well as maybe some other things, but if you're going to be dealing, I, I mean, they're as good as choo-choos, right? Uh, it's just I don't see the track in lines the way that I like to see it, but that's okay. Uh, that's just a little bit of the visual there. The little counters are fine. Uh, the rule book, hmm, it's simple. I'll give it that. It's small because the game is fairly simple and easily explained. There's not a lot of special cases here. Most XX games have, I don't know, maybe uh, at least 50% more rules. Uh, but I'm not sure that it's as clear as it need be, which is to say that I read through it and sometimes I'm not sure exactly what everything is. It takes another another skimming, but it's short enough that that's no big deal. Uh, so it kind of probably balances out in the end. is is as good as anything that you can expect. Um, what's special about this game <laughs> is that it is this kind of mixture. The winsome game designs usually are these real very calculable things. You can look at the board position and completely tell what something is worth if you work hard at it. This is a little bit further out of reach of that. And I like that. 
because it makes it easier. I already, I, I can tell that I can't calculate it enough. Um, although in some cases, the fact that I buy my train first, it means that I have to make my money decision at the end of the last turn, um, or during the, st during the, uh, the stock purchasing phase. So that kind of adds a little bit of annoyance factor to it where you have to remember what I'm doing. But you know, if you have a lot of cash on the company enough to buy a train, that immediately is a signal that maybe you intended to buy a train <laughs> and you went through certain aspects to get to that point. Um, one really interesting factor in this one is the idea that you can grab a bunch of certificates at once. You can just grab as many shares of one company as you like and have cash for uh, in one swoop. That takes some of the kind of weird cutthroat aspects out of the what is otherwise a largely XX-like framework. And what's kind of interesting about it is, yeah, you know, you're not going to see two people, say, collude to take a company away from you when you first start it. So you could see this in an XX game where you buy the president's certificate and the next two people say, hey, we can split that company or I can give you that company. Uh, the next player tells the third player down the line, I can give you that company in exchange for something. You don't have that. You can you slap down the money you want, you grab the company. Not that I've seen that very often, but it is something that could come up in some, some games. Probably not in the first uh, stock buying situation, but later in the game you could see somebody saying, yeah, I don't want him having control of that company, but I don't mind you having it. Um, in this you can buy what you can buy, and you buy it all at once. And if you left yourself open so somebody else can take it, they can take it from you. Uh, if they get the opportunity to do so next in line, they just get it. There's not going to be any race. There aren't other people able to intervene and say, Ah, oh, no, I want a share of that too, and I don't really care who owns it. It's going to do well. Um, that can spoil a takeover attempt. So there's a couple of really neat uh factors that come into play just because of the you can buy it all at once. It also speeds up the stock rounds. You're not whipping around, whipping around, whipping around, constantly buying and selling. It's much easier to remember uh, which things you've sold because you, you don't go around a half dozen times or more uh, buying and selling stocks just to get to some point. Uh, quite often in an XX game, the stock rounds take a ridiculously long amount of time. There's not as much room for uh, jerking the stocks around. In fact, you really can't, okay? If you're not the director of the company, when you sell shares, it means nothing. If you are the director and you sell any shares, you hurt the stock price. And that's one way that you can kind of hurt a stock, a company when you hand it off. But there aren't a lot of ways you can really hurt a company. Basically, if a company's on a strong foundation in this game, you can't damage it. Uh, well, you can damage it, but you hurt yourself. But you can't damage it in a way to hand it off. Uh, you can't rape it like you can in an XX game by buy, by grabbing the minor country companies. You can overrun companies. Uh, you can decide that a company's no good anymore and hand it off to someone. But you know they sat in your shoe in, in the same position as you did in terms of investment for it. There's also the neat factor of not handing the priority deal to the person to the left, normally to the right in my little special world, but to the left of the person who made the last deal. Instead, it goes to whoever uh, has the least money. And this is a really, really interesting feature uh, because it means, okay, it, me it, it gives no penalty for making lots of stock deals, but that's okay. There's less incentive to do so in this game. Uh, it's not like there's going to be these manipulators who are just trashing stocks left and right and all kind of stuff like that, who are giving up priority to the person to their left for that. Instead, what it, all it means is the person who's doing the worst in the last round, probably, uh, in terms of the income that they take in, will be the guy who gets the first shot at companies. Um, it also scrambles up the order, so seating order doesn't matter. So. 
in an XX game, if there's one person who's constantly dealing in stocks, hi, uh, <laughs> and you really want to be on his left, and then the guy to his right has a serious disadvantage, you know? I mean, look, if you're the guy playing with the stocks, you deserve what you got. But what about the poor schmuck sitting on your right who goes second to last every single uh, stock round? That doesn't happen here. Instead, it, it's all um, assigned by the amount of cash on hand you have at the end of uh, the operating rounds. Um, companies start on whatever money you put into them. You don't put enough money into them to get them running? Yeah, well, you're going to suffer. Your stock value is going to go down because you can't buy a train. That's your fault, right? You suffer no matter what in these games if you buy uh, shares to something, you know, in an XX game, if you buy shares that you can't run. You've got unprofitable shares holding up your money. It's like holding cash on hand, uh, except potentially worse. But in an XX game, you're kind of able to maybe reserve a presidency or something that you can't get started. And if somebody tries to take it away from you, you've got to jump on it so you can keep control of it. So it's a place to hide money in some, maybe money that can't make you a lot, in something that uh, you do want on your next turn and you may not get the chance to get it then. In this, you pay a price for trying to, trying to uh, put money into a company. In fact, we saw uh, in the playthrough a couple of people not put enough money in a company because the trains fell quicker than they expected or counted on or whatever, or because I don't pay much attention sometimes when I'm playing solo. And, uh, you know, they paid a serious price in terms of stock value. It goes back two spaces because you don't have a running train. And you're, it goes beyond you don't have a running train. Because let's go to the other aspect, this really neat aspect of uh, the way the maintenance costs work and the way they interact with the rusting or obsolescence of trains. So, every train you have costs you a certain amount of money. And when you're making your run. And that money takes away from whatever profit you'd get out of the connections that the train makes. In fact, there's something very nice about not having to work too hard for tracing the track lines, etc., and counting up and, and trying every different option. You have something very simple in this game. You just count your cities and add up the values that they produce. You can hit X amount of cities based on your train numbers. But you pay a penalty based on the number of trains you have, which means as the game goes on and on, uh, those little one trains that hit one uh, city each unless they're hitting a very valuable city, are not going to bring you extra money. And there aren't a lot of valuable cities, so unless, so if you have another train which can hit a decent amount of cities, you can increase your, um, your income uh, for that company by ditching a train. And that's how, you, how and why you obsolete things, is because I make more money by not paying that maintenance fee. It's no longer a profitable train for my company. That's very, very, um, I would say innovative because I haven't seen it anywhere else. But it also feels very intuitive in the sense that that's why companies stopped running these trains. They cost too much for the return they were bringing in. It was better to get a new fresh train that could deliver more passengers or whatever. And if you've played something like um, Railroad Tycoon on the computer, you have that kind of idea. You've got these trains and they're just accumulating this maintenance fee on them, especially as they get older, and they're no longer delivering enough money to be worth having. You want newer, fresher trains that even though you have to pay an upfront cost. Well, in this game, you have to pay a big upfront cost for the new train, but it immediately pays off more. So here's the uh, other kind of neat thing about that is that you're not stuck. So many neat things about that, actually. You're not stuck um, when a train is not doing terribly well. 
when it starts becoming old, you're not necessarily stuck losing it. If it's still an important train and you're still making money off of it, you can still run your company off this obsolete, essentially, train. Uh, you just would have made more if you had fresher trains. We saw in my game the pen was running some uh, a three and a one train for the whole uh, span of the game. Now the fact that they were doing that is part of why they lost, but it's possible to do it. There are other choices that you could make other than buying the trains. You're not forced into these train purchases usually. The exception to that is, of course, if you're no longer able to make a profit with your company. Now the pen, with all its coal mines running, was able to make a profit because of the coal mines, even if its trains maybe weren't all that profitable. And it was able to boost its income up quite a bit uh, just on the nature of having those coal mines and having at least one running train. All right. So what else about these trains is cool? They affect the time, the passage of time, the same way they do in XX. They move the phase of the game, essentially. And a lot of things are dependent on that. So do I have it here on a chart now? It's, whoops. It's only on the board, but you have this kind of nice uh, progression where, uh, you know, the number of hexes you're allowed to build cubes in each turn, the number of railways that are allowed to be in each city, the cost for maintenance per train. These are all affected by the phase of the game you're in, irregardless of whatever any here we go. Uh, of any particular, uh, how about just regardless, of any particular train that you have on your company, the time has passed for those trains, perhaps, but you can still run them. Okay. Uh, there was something else I wanted to talk about. I wish I could, like, keep things on a blackboard, because then I would remember what I want to say or scribble them down on paper, but I'm just not that organized. Uh, Ah, yes. So, if you happen to start a losing income off a train, or off your company's potential runs, that immediately starts affecting your stock value. That's a really nice feel. It's the, you know, earnings reports weren't as high as expected, right? <laughs> That's the kind of thing that affects stock value a lot more than people trying to game the market, right? Because really, real stocks, yes, you can game the market and make a lot of money off of it, or, but you probably can't devalue the company by gaming the market the way you can in an XX game. It feels very false, whatever XX is uh, representing there. It also, XX tries to go into this, okay, if the whole thing's sold out, it's a rare, it's a hard to uh, buy stock. Well, you know, a hard to buy stock that's not showing any improvement in income probably isn't going to go forward anyway uh, in terms of value. Somebody could be sitting on something privately that's just not worth much and it's not going to increase in value just because they can't sell it to anyone or haven't sold it to anyone. So again, the mechanism in, in Baltimore and Ohio is kind of nice here because what it says is you have to continuously improve your income and more than that, you have to kind of prove your willingness to pay out dividends. That works kind of nicely. I'm not sure I buy into it entirely because the stock value is still improving even on a swallow in my mind. Uh, it certainly becomes a more valuable stock to the players, perhaps, af right after a swallow. But as a game mechanism, I think it works pretty well there. Uh, that kind of low earnings era where no dividends are being paid out, you can see where that would suppress the market. So in terms of like a how does this game match to history versus an XX game, I think this does a much better simulative job. Uh, of handling railroads. Still keeping that kind of abstract and pulled away version. This is not a, a Silverton where, you know, you're, you're looking at every little piece and it's not a railroad tycoon where all these details are in place. And there again, I mean the computer game. My, my understanding is the board game is fairly simplistic. But, 
As a game, how does it go? Well, I think it's a little shorter than most of the XX games, although certainly I've seen 56 end very, very quickly, and some of those others, the 18 ALs, may be pretty short. It feels pretty intense in terms of the decisions you're making, more intense than the 18 AL, and, and uh, more intense certainly to me than things like 1870, uh, 2038. In terms of, there's a lot of capability for making some really drastic decisions in this game. One of the things that I had to worry about when I looked at it was, you got the same starting locations, the same companies, and nothing to shake them up, no privates, uh, initial bidding and offering. And how much is that going to affect things? And obviously, I've played it, you know, once two-player and once solo. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. However, in my solo play, it kind of felt like there's still enough in that core system, which is so similar to the core XX system, that, you know, you don't need that shake-up. I don't... There may be a book that can open up. There may be an opening book when it comes down to it for every number of players. Maybe. you got to take into account their experience, their temperament, and all kind of stuff like that, too, to be absolutely certain you're doing the right thing. Because maybe the uh, opening book is invest in somebody who buys the pen or, and or NYC. Make sure you have shares of those things because they are going to be big at the end of the game no matter what. Certainly, if everybody's investing in them, they're going to have uh, a big pile of money to, to make it to the to the uh, uh, to the cities they need to very early. But what if some schmuck is running it? You know, this is a game where, or maybe the person who's running it has come up with a way of defeating those leeches for a while or how to do that. It's hard to defeat leeches when you're holding more of the company than they are. Uh, but yeah, there is enough variability, I think, in the attitudes of the players, etc., that I'm not sure the privates make a, the lack of privates make a significant impact. However, if they do, we have the expansion. And the expansion doesn't add a private, but it adds these, one of the expansions adds the robber baron cards. What those robber baron cards do is they give you something that you can bid on that can make you very good income. Now, it's weird to bid on because you probably want to buy a handful of stocks before you put one of these up. Because when you put one up to market, you're taking your stock action to do so. And then everybody's allowed in on the bidding, right? Um, but you could evaluate how much it's worth to you, put an opening bid on it that you think's fair, and you might end up winning it right off that opening bid if you do that. Anyway, there you get a little shake-up in terms of the income capacity for the different players based on how these come out. And they will come out kind of randomly and may or may not be worth... Oh, wait. Yeah, I'm not sure. They seem The rules for this one seem a little weird. Like, there's little special rules in it that, uh, for example, the nickel plate is not in Chicago. It still starts. Uh, the nickel plate starts in Chicago. Oh, okay. I think that's just a clarification. You can't get money for the nickel plate before it's been in Chicago. Anyway, um, that's one of the expansions that gives you something to shake it up. The main lumber expansion shakes up the whole coal uh, advantage a little bit. It gives you an extra coal counter, essentially, in the north, but one that grows in value as the game goes. It starts out kind of weak, but it can grow up to being more valuable than any single call counter, and it's, my guess would be cheaper to reach than any of the others. Augusta's way up here. Now, I can't see anybody going up to Augusta, so it also opens up a reason to go there once it becomes valuable. Uh, the Norfolk and Western expansion throws something, and I kind of wanted to play these, but I decided against it because of the fatigue that sets in late in the game of XX. Um, the Norfolk and Western expansion throws in what may be a very, very valuable little company. One that runs only coal, but has its own special coal counters that produce 
the same way as the main lumber does at the at ten times the tech level. So those it, it doesn't even become available until tech level four. So it's sort of a late game potential catch up company that. Uh, people who don't have a lot of cash on hand have a chance to invest in first, as usual, uh, but it's something that comes in late in the game in a kind of nice way. That way. In fact, the turn three companies come in kind of late in the game too, with the first option going to the people who are doing the worst. What's weird about this one though is it can't run passengers, it can't run cities. All it's allowed to do is run the coal counters. If someone hasn't picked up the other coal counters, this guy can pick them up too. But he also gets the N&W coal counters and they produce a little bit more money. And that's kind of a nice, uh, a nice idea. I would have to see it in practice to see you know, how valuable it is to a particular player, whether it unbalances the game at that point, maybe provides too much of a catch-up. If it's a really potent company, more potent than those level three ones, it may be an unbalancing catch-up factor. Um, the level seven expansion basically just extends the game as far as I can see. Uh, if you think this game was too short, if you feel like it ends too quickly, this is a way to push it out to about the length of a regular uh, XX game. Did we leave one alone? No, that's all of them. Overall, I actually really like this. Um, so my XX games, out of, out of the pile, I sort of, I like 1856 maybe the best. It's hard, it's hard to say, because I've got such respect for 1830. And 1856 is, it's faster, more brutal, harsher, all those things it seems to me, but I've played less of it than I have of 30. Uh, we had a couple of people who really didn't like the 56, and we also had one person who really loved 18xx and could never get the hang of 1856. He, he would go bankrupt every single time. So we... He was one of our big XX players, and he seldom, you know, we would seldom play 56 without him. I don't know if we ever really did. Uh, so it always kind of flushed out as not feeling like we got to play it enough, right, to me. Um, but it has such a, a, a knife edge balance in the game, and it's got this possibility to crash real early in a way that 30 usually didn't with our group. We didn't have people who would say, ah, well, I have no chance, so I'm going to take this humongous risk, and maybe everybody will play into my hands, and it'll all work fine. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's how I hear uh, the uh, WBC games at the early level go. If you give the quality of the players the benefit of the doubt, if you don't give them the benefit of the doubt, they're just really clueless about 1830. Uh, I don't know. My group used to come back and say, my god, they're all idiots. Well, maybe not if they decided they were losing and wanted to crash the game. Um, I, I tend to feel like I rate that one the best, but 30 has such a tremendous uh, story behind it, such a, a, a powerful field of manipulations and everything. And I've studied it enough, I don't study much, but I, I think I've studied 1830 enough to feel like I really kind of get it. Yeah, I know some people say, no, you don't, man. <laughs> yeah, I have very different views from what seems to be uh, what the XX players who have really stuck playing a lot uh, feel about it. So I don't know, but I feel like I do get it. Um, those two are kind of in this upper tier of the games for me. And there's certainly some that I've never played, uh, and some that I've played not enough of. But I feel like this sucker is up there in that upper tier as an XX game. I think it's every bit as good as some of the best XX games on this limited amount of playing that I've put forward. Uh, there's something I really like about it. And on top of that, I think it's more accessible. You know, uh, 
it doesn't have quite the long uh, time period of play. It doesn't have so many complicated rules, but it flows. The decisions are easy like they are in XX. It's not like those winsome games where you have to calculate out every little penny uh, to try to figure out what you need to bid or what the absolute best move is. You can't do that in this, and I like that. So, yeah, I've, uh, I, I'm really impressed with this on sort of a so far, you know. I'll need to play it some more to see. And that was one of the reasons I kind of wanted to play with the expansions. Keep, test it out a little bit more with those suckers, see how it works with them. But yeah, I'm fatigued and would like to do something very different at this point than bend over handling that money and doing a lot of counting. So, And there is a lot of counting at the end still, uh, especially when you're playing it solo. If you're playing all by your, if you're playing multiplayer, when I played even two player, I didn't have all that much counting, but when you're doing every company and trying to rush through it at the end, yeah, it's, it gets kind of tedious, and they always do. All right, good one here.